Though animated films are often thought of as being comedies first, that's true of a lot less Disney films than you might think. 101 Dalmatians was probably their first straight up comedy. That's true right from the start, with bouncy, fun opening credits, focused less on childhood imagination, as is usually the case, and on charm and chuckles. Still, opening credits three minutes long, I don't know. Also, there's no cohesive order to the cast order, it's neither alphabetical nor an order of appearance. The film's look merits discussing now because it dictated the whole film's tone and direction. With this, Disney Animation switched to a geography process. Previously, after the animator had drawn their frames, ink artist retraced it onto animation cell sheets before it was painted and photographed. Geography allowed them to skip re-inking the outline by photocopying the drawings directly onto the cell. This technology didn't handle round objects well at the time. Hence, the film's design mentality is angular and graphic, rather than the soft, gentle look Disney Animation had favoured to that point. Writer Bill Peet realised this look would work best with a playful and loose story. So, by having a film that matches its animation style perfectly, the technology's primitiveness barely registers. Technically, there was no reason the backgrounds had to be as detailed light as the characters. That was an experiment by the artists, and one Walt himself wasn't fond of, feeling it took away from the fantasy he treasured in his films. A fair point, but the net effect is that the characters and backgrounds blend seamlessly. Does it feel cheaper than Sleeping Beauty, or even Lady and the Tramp? Yes, but it feels that way by choice, rather than to cut costs, even though that was the case. That deserves a special kind of praise. However, because the animation is actually pencil drawings, rather than re-inked over them, it looks very rough. The one problem is that, often in this film, you can see pencil marks the animator used to guide the character shape. The animator shouldn't have had to worry about erasing that, as previously the inkers simply ignored it when they inked the outline, so production oversight is a result of new technology. Enough of that, on to the actual film. As far as I could see, the old notion that a bachelor's life was so glamorous and carefree was all nonsense. Right from the start, this fluffy kids film has weight and texture. Ponga's gentle narration is so well done, having that British sensibility to it, expressing details on the side. Combined with the notion of the dogs considering their owners as the pets, and expressing it so well, it goes a long way. Though Pongo forgets to close the clock door, it's closed when Roger looks at it. Also, this surely can't be the first time Pongo's pulled this trick, so as funny as it is, odd Roger falls for it. Bit of an odd perspective, but Pongo seems smaller than Perisha here. The opposite is true otherwise Trout. Hmm, didn't know the new geography process could change the colour timing that much. The dress, hat, lipstick, it's all there. Did they just hold on a still frame for two seconds, except in the pipe soak? Yeah, that sticks out awkwardly. Pongo drags Roger away from his hat, yet he has it back after Pongo's tied him up with Anita. Perdita just loses her leash after being let go. Also, apparently 1960s British pawns can turn books into handbags. Could have fooled me. You have to love the look she gives him. She's basically saying, well, my pet approves of your pet, so I approve of you now too. The dog animation is not as realistic as in Lady and the Tramp, somewhere between dog and human, but it suits this film so well, really helping to show their personalities. Because the story is from the dog's perspective, it fits to cut past the romantic development straight to the wedding, leaving it up to the viewer how much time had passed. That's something old Disney animation often did well, implying lots of plot business without wasting time in it. It makes for a film that is never pandering, one any adult can enjoy just as much. Are you alright? <laughs> oh, of course, dear. After all, dogs were having puppies long before our time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about how they went about expressing the hormones of late-stage dog pregnancy. Comes across more as drink and douche drowsiness. It doesn't bother me all that much, but I should highlight how Nanny's design is barely any different from Fauna's in Sleeping Beauty, the previous Disney film no less. There's often something for audiences to chew on in a scene. Here, it's the process of writing pop music, as we hear Roger work out the Melody first, my dear, and then the lyrics, hmm? of one of Disney's catchiest, wittiest earworms. Cruella de Vil. Folks, we have reached a new low for low lip sync. It's spread to Roger's whole body. Cruella de Vil, Cruella de Vil. 
If she doesn't scare you, no evil thing will. Yes, this song deserves positive karma just for the final version. What a villain, folks. Cruella blends the shallow motives and insanity of fantasy villains with the all too humane evil of villains of contemporary stories, making for a delicious caricature of femininity. Couple that with her phony theatrical voice, halfway between New York and England, with all those darlings she keeps dropping, and the work speaks for itself. And her animation! The advantage xerography gives is it allows for a certain spontaneity to be preserved in the drawings. Look at the contrast of her skinny, bony, angular features against her giant fur coat. Add to that the way she's always storming back and forth, flailing her reedy limbs. Veteran Disney animator Mark Davis knocked it out of the park with Cruella. It's almost hard to appreciate anything else. She's that brilliant. But I'll try. Boy. I wish we weren't having any. Now that's how to do hormonal pregnancy mood swings. And yes, I'm applying human psychology to talking cartoon dogs. Don't judge me. Possibly one of the best non Cruella pieces of animation is Pongo's reactions during the birth scene. It can be easy to overlook the animation in this film, given how much the film's look seems unambitious, even though Disney animators never gave it less than their all. Given they were dealing with a technology change, it shouldn't be taken for granted. Another thing easy to overlook is the plot thread of Lucky nearly being stillborn. It doesn't have huge impact on the story, but it's another thing that makes it a cartoon with texture and weight. Oh Roger, he's alright! One of the puppies was almost stillborn, and you were concerned with checking its gender? I really don't mind, but it must be said, who left the back door unlocked during a storm? No, 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 I, I, I mean it. You're, you're not getting one. No, not, not one. And, and, and that's, that's... Final. Roger's verbal hesitation in shooting Cruella down is great. He has written a pop song about her in not such a positive light, so he'd understandably be a bit intimidated, given her wealth, even if he'd never say so. Where'd all the ink on Pongo's face go? Same goes for Pongo and Perdita's tags. The challenge faced with so many puppies is giving them individual personalities. The solution they came up with is great. They define a few quite well and allow them to act as the face of the litter in scenes. Yes, they are only cartoon personalities, but they straddle the line between human and dog as well as their more fleshed out parents. This might be the very first Disney example of a cartoon within a cartoon. What makes it excel is the clever interplay between the puppies and the show. This is the first Disney film set specifically when it was made but it never dates the film in a negative way because the contemporary jokes haven't lost any meaning. This Canine Crunchies commercial is still hilariously hacky and 50 plus years on. The vehicles in this film feel largely rotoscoped, meaning traced over live action footage. They stick out obtrusively as a result, as their movement is too smooth compared to the characters. You see a similar thing with CG vehicles in much modern traditional animation. Hey, we're from the gas company. Electric, electric. Eh? Uh, uh, electric company. Do I even need to say anything? There they go, Horace Milad. Out for their evening constitutional. Ah, oh, now, come off it, ducky. We got no time to palaver. <laughs> it's rare that an American film can get British slang and not make it feel too overblown. Maybe a carryover from the book, but it works. I'm curious why the lights were off in most of the house, but not the kitchen, other than giving the dog napping a gloomy atmosphere. I don't know what kind of British 60s paper has the body of text right below an article have nothing to do with the banner headline. Hmm? Oh, it's an unrelated article. It's an unrelated article. Hmm? Within the banner headline. Yes. Dog napping. Can you imagine such a thing? Fifteen puppies stolen. They are darling little things. Neat how Cruella's voice is given far less weight here initially, and then when she drops that darling, her vocal mannerisms seep back in. Wonderful way for a comic reveal. I love how Cruella's phone goes from a smiling devil mouth to a frowning one. The background painters were having a blast. Cruella basically set the ball rolling for the dog's investigation. Smooth play, devil woman. There's the twilight bark. Another nifty concept is the whole twilight bark. The way canine society is structured in England, further playing into dogs running the show above their pets goes a long way, segmenting into the film's dog-centric half. That the adventure part of the story bounces from animal to animal helping them out could have been problematic, except, again, for how well individualized they are, even animals with only a few lines of dialogue. Between the character animation and the strong screenplay, it really fortifies what might otherwise have been an ordinary back half. 
hey, it's Jock from Lady and the Tramp, plus Peg and Bull from the Dog Pound. Disney was doing cross-film cameos decades before Pixar made it cool. Not just pawns, 60s British windows are magic too, opening on their own. Probably my favourite of the other animals is Sergeant Tibbs. They gloss over why a tabby cat is such good pals with a dog and horse, implying a history we don't need to know. He becomes quite the anchor during the initial rescue, brave even when in mortal peril. Don't know what kind of colour timing could lead to Colonel B. Brown in his first appearance, and grey for the rest of the film. Two nights passed, I heard puppy barking over at Hell Hall. Hell Hall. Not a well-named hiding place, Cruella. It's supposed to be fading dark to make Hell Hall seem scary, but the lighting gets so close to black that it feels like a scene transition. The cut back to Tibbs ends up jarring as a result. By George, what window that big is light enough for a tabby cat that small to push it open so easily? There's 99 of us all together. 99? Dramatic effect, I know, but it looks like more than 99 to me. I overlook most minor number discrepancies, but ones like these must be noted. Jasper puts his half-full bottle down, yet it's empty when he throws it at Tibbs. The back bedroom window. It's always open a wee bit. Really? After being dog-napped, Roger and Anita still leave a back window unlocked? I rarely mention the effects animation in Disney, because it basically never falters. So, that it's as effective here as in any snowstorm in Bambi, despite the technology change and stripped-down visual look. Hey, credit is due. Cruella only appears in a small number of scenes, despite her impact. Horace and Jasper appear a good bit more. Obviously they're not Cruella, but unlike Cinderella's stepsisters being flimsy compared to her stepmother, they get the job done, especially when they start being subjected to all manner of slapstick. You better get out of here if you want to save your skins. Haha, <laughs> double meaning to save their skins? I'm dying over here? Okay, it's not that bad, but it doesn't quite work. Not only does What's My Crime still work as a parody of excessive reality programs, but the angle of a con friend of the duo being the guest criminal is especially funny. If the panel fails to guess your unusual crime in ten questions, you will receive two weeks vacation at a fashionable seaside resort. That is, of course, after you paid your debt to society. The way he visibly deflates and glances to the guard, who gives him a wary eye, folks. He knows that'll take much longer than two weeks. When Jasper and Horace are chasing Tibbs and the puppies, the layout of the manor's main hall mirrors itself compared to before. Oh, I ain't gonna hurt you, but I thought we was gonna pop them all. Shut up. Given how Jasper later reprimands Horace for suggesting the dogs could be clever, Audie thinks here that the puppies would understand them. Shut that door, Horace! They don't think to block off the hole they climbed out through before? Take over, Captain! After Colonel told Captain to wait on standby if they came, Pongo and Perdita don't even end up meeting him. They happen upon Colonel instead. Not exactly subtle, but that the previously gloomy hallways of Hell Hall get all blood red and foreboding right before the moments of skinning? Hey, the symbolism's there to see. The puppy that runs out here changes from Patch to Lucky. The lack of a spotted eye gives it away. It's not the finest slapstick Disney's ever done, but it's pretty great regardless, given the two sad sack thugs they came up with to bear the brunt of it all. Though Captain prepares to kick with his back left leg, he ends up kicking with his back right leg. Come on, I respect to the truck. We'll let him off in half a mile. Hmm, Captain, Colonel, and Tibbs didn't make much of an effort to stop them departing. The stretch of the film that's most routine is the cross country trek, excepting Corell's appearances, of course, but there's only so much of that. That snowy wind's got some sense of humour. It switches direction just as they double back to the barn, so it's still blowing against them. I get that's supposed to be a line of puppies going into the barn, but with no spots, they look more like white pigs than anything. Where is the milk? Come and get it, kids. It's on the house. It would have been funny if she said it was on the slate instead. That's British slang for putting it on your tab, usually at your local pub where you're a trusted regular. Not a negative karma or anything. Just felt like adding that. There was mild controversy at, well, this. Given the detail of this shot, I can see that, even if it doesn't bother me at all. The film doesn't need to spend time hammering home any moral of animals sticking by each other when physical harm rears its head. Just having all these animals none of our heroes know do what they can more than sells the humanity of animals. You know what I mean. Regarding this whole bit where Pongo's attempt to cover their tracks doesn't fool Cruella, I think it might have worked better had they not shown the puppies scrambling across and just Cruella piecing together the clues. That way, after the night at the barn, we wouldn't see them again until they reached Dinsford, implying more about their journey's hardship than seeing them trekking further.
Another thing easy to overlook in old Disney animation is the score. Background music then was typically unobtrusive life flowing classical. With barely any songs, there's more time to make an impression. And this puppy theme, played in moments of fun or joy with the puppies, like their birth, is a decent recurring motif. It seems to be morning when they arrive in Dinsford, but the gloomy clouds suggest dusk a mere minute later. Don't know what to make of that. Mother, should we? That's clearly a girl puppy, with the voice and eyelashes and all. Kind of breaks the visual rule they had going of red collars for males and blue for females. The pacing really slows down a bit in this last section, not entirely to its benefit. A little too much of getting them all on the truck. Looks like the California artists missed getting the English setting 100% right. AAA stands for American Auto Association. It should just be AA for Automobile Association. Apart from adding a fair bit of excitement after the slower paced track, the car chase is great for having Corel's car break apart, becoming just as deranged as she as it progresses. The truck isn't there after the cut during Corel's crash off the bridge. What happened with the snow here? Looks like they tried to insert live action footage. As Jasper and Horace approach, the truck and Corel are coming from the intersection's right, but at collision, they've come from the left. Also, the junction loses a signpost, but gains telegraph poles and wires at the moment of impact. I'll be honest, the logistics of the collision are all over the place, given the duo take 20 plus seconds to get to the intersection from here, and Corella and the truck gain several twists and turns to veer around in between. That's your first big hit. It hasn't been long since he first conceived of the song, a few weeks to the puppy's birth, a few more for their spots to kick in, and another few during which they were missing. To have it professionally produced and on the radio that quick. Not how Top of the Pops works, that's for sure. <laughs> of course all the noise rouses the neighbours. Better move out to that country home quick, fellas. <laughs> this really surprised me on the rewatch, folks. I had it in mind that it was serviceably good outside of Cruella, but it really is one of the most fun and entertaining Disney animations around. It's an immaculately constructed comedy, full of texture, weight, humanity, charm, and wit the whole way. Minor characters are so well defined, largely due to the character animation being as complex as ever. For a film that is basically a surface level kids adventure story, it's by and large the best version of itself it could have been. Minus 17. It's no Lady and the Tramp, but I'll be darned if it's not just as entertaining in its own way.